As I said, it's great to have Bud and Pam. It's, it's great to have them because it's like having them home. Uh, it feels even better for me now that I've been down there. Uh, you've met the other pastor, Sidney, that was with us a few weeks ago, and he shared his heart and the focus of what's happening down there. And so I've asked Bud to come. He shared this message with a group of pastors a couple weeks ago, and I said, would you please just repeat it? Because we all need to hear it. So, Bud, welcome. You know, I love coming back here and taking abuse that I'm old, but, you know, his hair looks older than mine because mine fell out, but his stayed there. <clears throat> People think we're brothers. We are brothers in Christ, and so we forgive each other when we offend each other a little bit. That's what the Bible says, right? We're supposed to, so you're forgiven. We'll talk later, though. <clears throat> um, just a quick word. I have two books. They're the best books I've ever written. And uh, I'm not sure they're that great, but they're great to me because they share my heart. One of them is called The Satisfying Life, and the other is Six Metaphors of a Happy Marriage. We have a group coming from your church to work with us this summer in Brazil. And so these books are $10 a piece or two for $15, and all of the money goes to the Brazil campaign. So they're outside on the table, and if you would like to buy these, you're also helping uh, kids from your church make their way down to be with us this summer in Brazil. And we're looking forward to having them come. And Brazil's in kind of a crazy time right now. Things are really, really good, and things are really, really bad. Um, but the, the economy is bad. The politics is bad. Uh, a lot of things are not well. But the churches in Brazil are doing well, real well, praise God. They're doing really, really well. It's really doing incredibly well. It's amazing when things are hard in a country how that God will pull people to the church, pull people to Jesus. And right now the Brazilians are wide open to the gospel. Uh, one of the reasons we're in Brazil is because it is so open, <clears throat> so open to the gospel. And you met our pastor, Sijini. Uh, he's a walking party, that guy. I mean, all Brazilians love to party, but that guy is amazing. And he attracts people and, and loves people. It's been fantastic to work with him. Um, Russell, I brought a message to some pastors who were here recently a couple weeks ago, and it's entitled The Bottom Line. Um, I'll be 65 next week, and I've been running through this world a long time now, and as you go through life, you learn. And it's really a process of elimination a lot of times. I, in fact, I think I've actually learned more from my mistakes than from the things I got right. Uh, you, you, you eventually come to certain conclusions, and you go, you know what, that just does not work. Somebody said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Um, and if you keep trying the same thing over and over and over again, eventually you come to the conclusion it, that just doesn't work. And you give up on it finally. And sometimes when you give up on something, you, you get to see the truth in a brand new way. And I feel like that ever since I received Jesus when I was 16 years old, I, I have been learning a lot of things a lot of times by trying over and over and over to do certain things and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work and then finally you come to a certain conclusion and then the Bible opens up to you and the words of Jesus open up to you and you come to some bottom lines. And so I, don't I want to talk to you this morning about seven bottom lines, seven things that I would like for you to listen to and consider and let the Holy Spirit be your teacher, not me. Uh, these are precious truths to me. They're things that I really am not going to struggle with anymore because they've become a part of who I am. They're bottom lines in my life. And I hope that you can just listen, walk through this a little bit, and maybe meditate on these, and then take this home with you and think this through. I think it's something that can be useful to you. I know it's been very useful to me. The first one is this. Jesus is all and is in all. Can you say that with me? Jesus is all and is in all. Uh, this phrase comes from a verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, that says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, 
circumcision or uncircumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. I've been here a while in this world, and I have watched the American culture and the Brazilian culture talk about equality, talk about justice, talk about the end of racism, talk about a lot of things. I've spent my whole life observing and living through this, and you're doing the same thing. And it's really easy to believe that there is just never going to be a time in human history where equality actually exists. Sometimes we think this is just an American problem, and our history is, is not pretty when it comes to equality, and we have had many, many tragic moments in our nation's history. But I've lived outside the country, and many of you have lived outside the country, and it doesn't matter where you go, the subject of inequality is one of those things that runs through every society, whether it's social inequality, economic inequality, religious inequality, racial inequality. It just, it just runs through the human experience. And it seems like we just cannot find a way to put people together and create some sense of true equality. Well, this verse gives us hope. And this is a bottom line now in my life. I do believe there exists one way for human equality to be birthed immediately in us. When Jesus comes into our life and he takes up residence in our life and we experience his love and then we meet another person in whom Jesus also has taken up residence. That person can be Jewish. That person can be non-Jewish. That person can be of a different race. That person can be of a different socioeconomic level than we are. But if we can see Jesus in that person, and, if Jesus can, and, and they can see Jesus in us, there can be in us an immediate equality. I'm not talking about equality of circumstances. In Brazil, I work in a church which is in a very, very affluent community in the, on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. But just across the major highway from our church, there's the other reality of Brazil. And I work on both sides of the, of the highway. I preach in both sides. I counsel people from both sides. And it, it seems like there could never be anything that could ever fix that divide, economic divide in Brazil. But I have experienced when I walk into the affluent home or whether I walk into the home where, the, where it's just a shack and I'm in the presence of a Christian and I'm an American and I've got a passport which will let me leave anytime I want to. I've got a credit card that will give me all kinds of money whenever I need it. And I'm standing in the presence of someone who certainly does not have a credit card and certainly cannot leave. I have found that they can look at me and I can look at them and there is a connection of equality between us because Christ is all and is in all. Now, that, that, that may not sound like much, but in my experience as a human being here for 65 years, I haven't seen anything else that can immediately create an environment of equality. Jesus said, if there are two or three gathered in my name, I will be in the midst. I've lived that. I've experienced that. I'm not saying that that allow us, allows us to do away with all the differences and all the problems, but at least it gives me that hope that when I can see Jesus in the life of a person and they can see Jesus in my life, we have a place to start. From there, we can get to know one another. From there, we can see each other equally. I remember when I first went to Brazil back in 1979, that I really, really had a hard time at times being comfortable going into certain environments, especially into the environments of deep poverty. It still troubles me deeply when I go there because I feel so unable to really help. But I think the problem is more on my side because what I have found in those people that are living in that poverty, that they are very quick 
to sense Jesus in me, and they have to ignore a lot of things about me that are completely foreign to their reality, but they immediately receive me as equal in that place with them, and it has given me a relief to believe that there is a way. There is a way. There is a community in the world that can live equality if we will learn to see people in Christ and not see people as they may appear to us as a society defines them, but we would see them as equal to us in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to be open to this kind of equality in your life, that you would take the risk of being able to look into a person's heart and see if you can see Jesus there, and if you can, live, even if it's just for moments, that equality, and imagine what would happen if that kind of equality could spread and spread and spread and spread and spread until perhaps we can find other levels of equality through Christ. Jesus is all and is in all. Can you say with that me with that with me with that phrase one more time? Jesus is all and is in all. If we can start there, that's a bottom line. That's a bottom line. The second one is this the quality of our center that determines the circumference of our love. Galatians four nineteen says, My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. The Apostle Paul, in a very complicated local church situation, he was concerned for a church, and that church was dividing up over laws and rules and regulations. There were those who thought in order to be a Christian, you had to be go through Jewish rituals and you should only eat certain foods. And they had come in and they were trying to make the church divide up into groups of right and wrong, and the Apostle Paul clearly lays out before them. And he says, your greatest concern should not be getting everything right on the outside. Your greatest concern should be taking care of the center of your life. Have you ever looked at all the things you're responsible for on a day-to-day -day basis? The circumference of your life? And it's like that old illustration of spinning plates. How many of you ever felt like you're spinning plates all day long? And you're trying to keep the circumference going, and you start up something, and you're spinning that plate, and you start up another thing, and you're spinning that plate, and then a child is born, and you spin that plate, and then another one is born, and you spin that plate. And one day you just you kind of collapse because you can't keep the circumference of your life moving and then somebody comes in the pulpit and gives you another plate to spin? Or somebody tells you you should be doing something else and you just feel overwhelmed? Well, I've learned in my life that spinning those plates was never to have been what I give my attention to. It's been a hard lesson. And it came more from failure than from success. But what I have learned is this that if I will develop within myself a relationship with Jesus where he is the center of my life, where he is the one who sustains me, and where I really understand without Jesus I can do nothing, then he will very carefully increase the circumference of my life because by increasing the circumference of my life, he is allowing me to love people that have been beyond the limit of my love. So he, as he is formed in me, he expands the parameters, the circumference of my life. I remember when I met Pam and we were dating and thinking about getting married. I was only 19 and she was 19. And um, I told her, I said, Pam, she grew up on the mission field. She's a missionary's daughter, so she grew up in Brazil. And I did never have any idea about leaving the United States and so I looked her right in the eyes, and I said, Pam, I love you, but there's something you need to know. I will never be a missionary. Have any of you ever told God, I will never anything? That's your circumference. I, I will never love that kind of person. I will never do this. We have to be very careful with that word never, because sometimes that never is limiting something in our lives. Well, Pam looked at me, and 
Pam has always kind of taken me sort of seriously most of the time. But she also knows that I will say things that are kind of off the wall from time to time. And she said, well, do you, will you listen to God if he says for you to go to the mission field? And I said, yeah, I will, but he's going to have to write it on the wall. Well, he wrote it on the wall. Now I live in Brazil. You know, it's interesting because I think I was afraid of going to Brazil because I didn't think that I could spin the plates. I didn't think that I could live in another culture except the culture of my childhood. I was born here in Miami. I, did, I, th I think that I, thought, I was afraid that I could never live. For me, Brazil was a jungle, the whole thing. I didn't know there was Rio and Sao Paulo. But God knew that if Jesus grew in me, then he could send me further and further away from that which is comfortable for me. You may not have to leave um, your comfort of moving from one country to another, but just the people who move in next to you can change your comfort level. Just the people that are in the po political world can move your comfort level. But if Jesus is the center, then God will expand the circumference of your life, and you will end up loving people you couldn't love before. You will end up blessing people you couldn't bless before. Number three, our marrow is good, but our joints are a mess. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is a great verse. It describes that, the Bible, the Word of God, and also Jesus, who is the living Word of God, can penetrate into our inner life and separate two things that are un un uh, unified but need to be separated to be understood. He said he can separate your marrow from your joints. Or your marrow from your joints. It can separate your, 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 your spirit from your soul. Uh, let me explain it like this. If you were to get very, very sick, and I'm not doing any prophetic thing this morning. If you were to get very, very sick, and you went to the doctor this week, and the doctor examined you thoroughly and came back with the exam results, would you rather that the doctor found a problem in your marrow or in your joints? How many would like to have a problem in your marrow? I don't see any hands. There's a reason for that. It's because if you get a sickness in your marrow, it's life or death. Because in the marrow is where there's a reproduction of life in the blood. And if you get sick in your marrow, it's life or death. So I guess you'd rather have a problem in your joints, right? If you have to have a problem, you have injuries. How many of you have some sort of problem in a joint? Raise your hand. Let's see how sick this church really is here. We all do. Our joints are always giving us problems, and the older you get, the more apparent they become. Well, let me be your spiritual doctor this morning, and I want to just give you some good news, and then I need to give you some bad news. The good news, I've seen your spiritual exam, and all of you who have Jesus living in you, who have the Spirit of Christ in you, your marrow is 100% pure, pure, and protected for all eternity, you have eternal life. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, he who believes in me shall never die. I have something really good to say to you as the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. You will never die. Now let me talk to you about your joints. Your body illustrates what your soul is like. Your soul has three parts, your mind, your emotions, and your will. And it is with your soul that you make movement in life. It is with your soul that you move about in this world. And your body illustrates this. Your mind, and in here there's a major joint at the neck. And then here you have your emotions, your heart, your emotions, and then there's a major joint system here, and then there's your legs. 
Now, your mind and your emotions and your will should function without any limping. But let me show you how we limp. How many of you, as a Christian, have been deeply offended by someone, maybe even in the church, and in your mind, your theology said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But in your emotions, you said, kill them, because they did it. It's only me? Okay, well, what went on there? What went on is, is when your mind and your emotions don't match, you limp with your will. You want to forgive them, but you want to kill them. The only cure for that is for the Spirit of God to so fill your soul that you can be like Jesus and you can live like Jesus. And little by little, he can calm down your mind, emotions, and will. When I married Pam when I was 20, I had a tremendous problem with anger. My, my, my uh, marrow was good. My spirit was good. I didn't want to hurt Pam. But in our marriage, I severely damaged our marriage in the beginning because I was so frightened of losing her because I had lost my father when I was a child and I kind of had this fear of something bad happening to her that I held her very tightly to me and nearly suffocated our relationship because in my mind, I loved her, but in my emotions, I was so afraid to lose her that I was very jealous and very controlling. Thank God over the years, God has calmed my mind, calmed my emotions, so that I can be the kind of husband that will properly treat my wife so he gets my joints working again. So our marrow is good, but our joints are a mess. That's true of every believer. In some area of your life, you limp, and we're all in recovery. Number four, there is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot cure. There is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot cure. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I remember as I first accepted Jesus that I began to practice a discipline of confessing my sins. And I, over the years, developed the habit of using a prayer diary. And in there, I would have pages where I would confess my sins of thought, my sins of word, and my sins of deed. And over the years, I noticed that I don't sin in a whole lot of ways, but the ways that I do sin are repetitive. And it seems like there are certain sins I just can't get rid of. Impatience, judgmentalism, fear, envy. There are certain sins that seems like, why in the world am I constantly tied up with these? Anger was one of those as well. And I began to learn that those places were the places that came from my childhood where a certain kind of fear got into me. Envy was the fear that I will never have what other ha others have. And if I get it, I'm going to lose it. Judgmentalism was kind of like, I was kind of a small kid, but I had a big mouth. And I learned how to defend myself verbally because I couldn't really defend myself so well physically. And I had these habits in my childhood, and they became ingrained responses to life. And you know, it would be easy to think that you're going to have to be that way the rest of your life. But there is this wonderful truth. It's in Galatians 5.16. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If I will one day at a time, and literally it has to be one day at a time, if I will one day at a time submit my soul to the Spirit and be filled with God's Spirit, then He will release me from these normal reactions that have come from my childhood and my experience in the world, and I will find myself relaxing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the minute I stop, the verse comes back, without me, you can do Nothing. But if I'll do that on a day-to-day -day basis, then I can be free because there is nothing that the presence of Jesus cannot cure. Let me encourage you. If you have a repetitive area in your life, anger, 
fear, anxiety. I'm not telling you to focus on the problem to fix it. I'm saying focus on Jesus one day at a time, and he will expel the fear, which is the real source of that repetitive error in your life. And the truth will set you free, and he will cure you. Now, you're only cured one day at a time, one moment at a time. I think maybe God allows us to keep these weaknesses so that we will learn when I am weak, then I am strong. And I think he allows these weaknesses to remain with us. Number five, our life is perfect, but our world is not. Our life is perfect, but our world is not. John 16, says these, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Some years ago, a lady came to speak with me. She heard me preach a sermon in our church, and she made an appointment, and she wanted to come in and talk about her life and about her problems, and she was profoundly depressed. When I first entered the ministry, I had all the answers. Now that I've been in the ministry all my life, I only have one answer, and that's Jesus. And it makes it a lot easier for me to work with people. So when she sat down, I said to her, I don't know you and you don't know me, so it really would help me if you would tell me about your life. And she said, do you have time? Now, I've learned over the years that if a woman says, do you have time, that it, it's going to be more time than most men want to give. And I, and I said, I have time. And, I, and she said, I said, I just want to hear about your life. Now, the reason I did that was because I've learned that when someone talks about their life, they will reveal their center to you. Now, they may talk about the circumference, all the plates they're spinning, but in the process of talking about their life, they will actually reveal what's going on inside their heart, where the real issues lie. And so she began to tell me her story. It was a story of, of a horrible childhood. There was abandonment. There was sexual abuse, horrible experiences as a teenager, a couple of divorces, all types of conflict. She spoke for two hours without stopping, except to cry. And I wept with her. I don't think I've ever heard in all my years of ministry a, a more sad story that someone could have gone through. And she was only about 35 years old. So when she got finished, I didn't want to hurt her anymore. I didn't want to offend her anymore. I said to her, you're my sister in Christ, and I need to say something to you, and it might hurt a little bit. Will you give me permission to say what I think that I need to say? And she said, yes, go ahead, Pastor. I, I need to hear what you've got to say. I said to her, I ask you to tell me about your life, and for two hours you have told me the story of your pain. Every word that you said was about something that hurt you, and your whole narrative about your life was, pain. So I believe that what lives at the center of you and what you consider to be your life is your pain. And I said, now, the only way that I think we can help you or I can help you is if we change what is at the center of you without ignoring what happened to you. And I said, so here's what I want you to think about. You are a believer in Christ, are you not? And she said, yes, I am. And I said, so here's something I want to say to you, and I'd like to hear you repeat it back to me. I said, Jesus is my life, and my life is perfect. Can you say that with me? Jesus is my life, and my life is perfect. The minute she said that, it was like her whole body began to relax. And then I said to her, now I want you to say this. Jesus is my life. Jesus is perfect. My life is perfect. My world has been hell. And she said it, and she totally lost it. And just wept and wept and wept. Why? Because when you make what's happened to you in this world, who you are, and it becomes the center of you, then the circumference of your world collapses on you. 
It literally just collapses on you. And when it collapses on you, you will develop ways to keep it from hurting too bad. You will drink, you will drug, you will become sex addicted. You will do something to keep something that seems like it's going to give you some relief. And in her case, it, were, it was a complicated mess, but there was no way that we could really help until she was courageous enough to say, my life is perfect. My world has been hell. That's one of the hardest things for many of us to grasp. And I want to encourage some of you who have had a world that has collapsed on you to remember that if you have Jesus, there is perfect life still beating in the marrow of your heart. And he will not leave you. And he will not let your world destroy you. He can lead you to victory over your world. I've seen him do that in my life and other lives. The sixth one, whatever gets your attention gets you. In Psalm chapter 1, there is a beautiful passage about two ways of looking at life. And I want to read it to you. I don't think it will appear on the screen, but I, I just want to read it to you. And you pay attention to the two ways of looking at life. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in, se in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, for they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. There's two kinds of people described here. There are people that are focused on what the world thinks and what the world has concluded and what the world is saying. It's a very cynical way of looking at life. It's like, who cares, whatever. But then there's a person who meditates on the law of God night and day. Now, the idea of law for us is hard to get an idea of correctly. When we think of law, we think of something very negative, very controlling. But in the Bible, the word law is not a negative idea. It is basically a, a, a blessing. The law of God tells us when, where, and how our love stops. For instance, the Bible says, thou shall not kill. Well, what that's saying is, if you kill a person, your love stops. It says, thou shalt not lie. If you lie to a person, your love stopped. It says, you shall not steal. If you steal from a person, your love stops. It says, thou shalt not covet. If you covet what another person has, your love stops. You see, the law is not about stopping you. The law is about you knowing when your love stops. Because you exist for two reasons, to love God and love your neighbor. And the most serious error that you can make in your life is to stop loving anyone you were loving. The most serious error a human being can make is to start loving someone and stop. But that's what we all do. And that's why the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is simply stopping love. A person who meditates in the law day and night is a person who says, I need to know when my love stops because what I want to do is love. And that person who dedicates their life to love will be like a tree planted by a river of living water, and that life will give fruit in its season and will be a success. Now, that's not talking about financial success. It's talking about relational success. And many of you know and have met people who have been very poor but very rich in love. Have you not? Many of you have seen them. They're very poor, but in love, they've got it. In Brazil, it's still not unusual to see families of 10 or 12 or 14 kids. And you wonder, how in the world? Well, you know what keeps those families going? Love. 
And then you see people who have no children who can't keep their own relationship going. Why? Because what gets your attention gets you. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. Give your attention to love. First of all, give your attention to the love of God that lives in you. Every morning, wake up saying what that song said. He is a good father. That's who he is. And it is what I am because he loves me. Understand this. There is perfect love that arrives in your heart every day exactly in the measure for you to live one day loving others. You will get exactly the amount of love you need to deliver one day at a time if you'll focus on love. If your one prayer is this, Lord, help me to love you and love my neighbor, that's meditating on the law of the Lord, and God will give you that love. Whatever gets your attention gets you. And the last one, Underestimating Jesus threatens our lives and the quality of our life. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. You know that your, your, your eternal life depends on your estimation of Jesus. The minimum estimation of Jesus for you to be able to be forgiven and go to heaven is you have to say that he is the Son of God who died for your sins, died for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead. I don't know what you think of Jesus today, but you need to at least get to this level. He is the Son of God. Amen? But from there, you need to learn. It'll be a, a lifelong journey adjusting your estimation of Jesus to his real value. Uh, recently, there was a special program on National Geographic on a cable channel, and there was this couple that their hobby was to go out into junk shops out in California and out in that area of the country looking for treasure, stuff that people had sold that was worth a lot of money, and they were really good at it. I mean, this was how they had a great time, and they even made a little bit of money finding things that were of value hidden away in these stores, which was selling stuff like a flea market sort of value. But they also were students of history, and they especially liked photographs. And they went into one store, and they found a photo, and they looked at the photo, and they thought to themselves, that looks like a famous American criminal named Billy the Kid. How many of you ever heard of Billy the Kid? Not everybody. He's kind of like El Chapo for today. Okay? I mean, he was a bad dude. But he was famous because of how bad he was. But he was a little guy. That's why they called him Billy the Kid. He was just a little guy, but he had a big gun. And he was really mean. Well, there was only one known photograph of Billy the Kid. Because this was like 120 years ago. And that one photo was very, very valuable. And they saw this photo in this junk store. And they thought it might be Billy the Kid, so they paid $2 and took that photo with them, along with a couple of other photos. They began a research project. It took a lot of time because they had to prove what's called provenance. And provenance is when you prove the origin of something beyond doubt. And when you can prove the origin of something beyond doubt, the value of that thing will go up. Well, they proved that it was a picture of Billy the Kid and his gang. It was authentic. And the value went from $2 to $5 million. Because they proved the provenance, where it came from. Now, can you, I want you to think with me for a minute. Imagine the people that had held that photo during the last 130 years. It was in somebody's house all along. And those people probably went to bed at night going, man, we are so poor. I wish we could get a new car. You know, I sure wish we could have a surgery on this problem that our child has. Can you imagine the drama that was around that photo all these years? But they had it in a box somewhere in the house. And one day they said, well, we need a little cash, so we'll take it down to the flea market and sell it. And somebody bought it for less than $2. And then one night they turned on their TV, and then they came on the program, National Geographic, and they were all sitting around the dinner table, 
And the story came, and they said, that, that's the photo. Can you imagine the shock? If they're here this morning, they're sick. There's something that you need to understand about the person who lives in you. The person who lives in you, Jesus, is so much more than you estimate him to be. I mean, I've been working on my estimation of Jesus now for about 50 years as a pastor. And I can tell you this. I do not really have a clue of who this is that really lives in me. But every time my opinion of Jesus goes up, I gain peace. I am cured. I am prospered. I am blessed. And, my, and the joy goes up inside of me not because my world got better, but because I am now more aware of the provenance of who this is that lives in me, which is Jesus. You can change your life today dramatically if you will just move your estimation of Jesus up a notch. And if you will keep it moving up, you will find everything changes because if you have Jesus, you lack nothing. We started with this bottom line. Christ is all and is in. Can you believe that? Start there. That is a bottom line. The richest the wealth that is in you is eternal wealth, eternal life, eternal peace. And I want you to see Jesus, hear Jesus, love Jesus, and live Jesus. Because Jesus is, in fact, the bottom line. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your kindness, your patience with us.